Good morning. Our new, our new opening, <laughs> gong. Welcome to First Parish Church in Billerica, a Unitarian Universalist welcoming congregation. Whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you're welcome here this morning. And we invite you to stay after the service for coffee and conversation. My name's Brita. I'll be the worship assistant for today's service. I'm head of the worship committee. That's why you see me up here all the time. <laughs> Um, and our worship leader this morning is our part-time minister, uh, Reverend Steve Wilson. He preaches on the first and third Sundays of the month, he also leads the adult education classes, provides pastoral care, and does much, much more. Um, he really weaves caring and humor into his services. He's just great. <laughs> And we're very, very happy uh, to have him with us. Are there any announcements? Actually, I have some announcements. Um, please turn off your cell phones, <laughs> everybody, so we can enjoy the service. And also, Bill Ricca now is at high risk for COVID. So we're going back to asking that people please wear masks in the sanctuary, unless you're talking in the mic um, during the service. And especially please wear your mask when you're singing, because that's when it will project. Okay. Oh, any announcements? Uh, theology this Saturday, the discussion group, 10 o'clock. There's a um, theology discussion group uh, at 10 o'clock. Here, at, on this Saturday in the RE room. Okay. Why don't you, why don't you introduce me? Okay. All right, so we have a youth group uh, trip bowling today. It seems like there's going to be some parents and stuff coming to Collins Bowl from one to three. This coming Saturday, I'm leading a theology discussion group at uh, just here at church, usually up in the RE room. And on the 21st in the evening, we're having a solstice uh, themed service here, six to eight, I believe Trek is going to lead those. On the uh, Saturday afternoon after that, we're going to have another, on the 4th, we have another theology discussion group at 10, and then from 12 to 2 or 3, we're going to come uh, figure out what stuff's going to go in a yard sale, and we do a little church cleanup and kind of assess uh, what we might sell, and we're going to try to do a, com a community-wide yard sale so people can come, like, you know, get rid of stuff and probably buy one another's things and, you know, trade the abundance of uh, stuff we all have. So um, that's what comes to mind. And uh, we have, let's see, what else? Lots of uh, lots of earth circles headed our way. And, you know, people are w welcome to sign up for coffee hour. Lisa and Mike did that today. They're regulars there and great we're grateful for their food and for their participation is, is always really high. So we could use greeters. Um, I'm also on the 5th of February, we're going to have uh, Barbara's granddaughter is going to be dedicated. So it's going to be kind of a special day. And um, I'm looking for one more person to uh, to speak about um, what it's why it's meaningful for them to be a UU just a little short, you know, two to three minutes that's going to take the place of the sermon that day. So it's called why am I a UU or why do I love to be a UU. So uh, there we go. And um, Brady's going to do our land acknowledgement and maybe a couple other announcements. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, so I, we want to first acknowledge that First Parish Church, this building was built on the unceded land of the Pawtucket and Massachusetts people. We acknowledge the connection that they maintain with the land here in this place we call Bill Ricca. And we acknowledge the hardships they have endured and commit ourselves to caring for the land and fostering good relationships with our indigenous neighbors. And now I believe we're going to greet each other. Yeah. Greet your neighbor. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, all. 
I invited you all to unmute for this part because oh. I want you to be able to participate too. Bless your heart. Good morning. How is good the sound morning. overall? Sounds good. Sounds good. Yay. <laughs> I'm so easily amused. <laughs> okay, I'm going to put it back to the sound for everybody. Okay, don't get too rowdy. Yeah. I'm going to ask Brita to uh, get ready to light our chalice, not quite yet, but soon. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I had this, uh, I threw this little Martin Luther King sermon title in, which is a pretty easy thing for you used to do in a slot on this day, right? Makes a lot of sense. And then I ignored it. And then I realized I have some talked about civil rights, not necessarily here, but other places. And I realized that I hadn't ever really written a Martin Luther King service on him. And for you, you, that's a little bit odd. So I never directly talked about the hero of this weekend. And I, he's sort of been a hero of mine, but I had never gotten around to do that. And being a justice minded person who's sort of a little bit too cautious and complacent for my own wishes. Martin Luther King's always been a bit of a guiding light for me and a bit of a judge. And um, we went to BU together, not together, but I followed him to BU as part of my motivation to go to the seminary there. Um, so today's about what price it is for a person to, that we, you know, what does it take to have statues and boulevards named after you? What's it take to become probably the most famous African-American in American history? How does one go from a little boy named Mike before he was named Martin to being a martyr? And we're not going to have we're not going to sing out the kids today. The kids are going to stay in, in, in the church and they're welcome to come down and I'm going to kind of preach sort of towards them in addition to having a children's moment. But we're not going to sing out our kids today. And now we would light our chalice with these words from Andrew Pakula. Let there be light, the light of joy, the light of happiness, the light of contentment. May it illuminate our paths and fill our lives with peace. And let there be dark, for it is from our dark places that we are brought forward, we get tried and tested, and we get impelled towards growth. It is in these places, the dark places, that we realize compassion. It is in that play of light and dark. Please stand as you are willing and are able and sing through your masks as best you can for Gather the Spirit, a hymn written by a UU, Jim, who's been here many times. Join in. We're going to listen through the hymn for the first verse, and then we're going to join in three, four, seven. Standing is in body and or in spirit. Thanks. Any kids who have the courage to come up, I'd love to have them come forward. Come sit if you want, or I can, you can stay where you are. It's up to you. There's only a couple. You stay where you are. I'll talk to everybody. So, a long time ago, about a hundred years before the, um, this church was an institution at all, in uh, in in four in the four in fifteen um, fifteen sixty eight in the city of Torda, something kind of remarkable happened. Does anybody know what that was? No, probably not. Uh, a guy named Francis David was this leader, and he was inspired. And this was in what is now Transylvania. So we have 
ha ha ha, we have this Transylvanian roots, it's part of where we get our history. And on January 13th, so it was two days short of 445 days ago, there was a, a gathering of religious leaders and politicians. They had a unitarian, it turned out that they had a unitarian king. We've had one unitarian king in our past. He didn't live very long. He died in a wagon accident, fell and hit his head. Um, so in this spot and time is where we get our history of being tolerant of different ideas. So is it the Edict of Torta? The Edict of Torta was the Edict of Tolerance. And this guy named Francis of David, there was a proclamation of religious faith. It's kind of a famous UU scene. You can, pass, I'll, you know, I'll you leave it up here and you can pass it around. And very kind of Martin Luther King-like. And he said a famous thing, and this is a good UU quote to remember, to pro one of the most popular UU quotes you could get in your head. He said, we need not think alike to love alike. We need not think alike to love alike. And so when you're explaining your church, you can say that, you can think about that. And that was Francis David. And then there was a transition of power and he got imprisoned, but for a moment, there was this tolerance that came over. And in that time, everyone, it was the time of like religious wars and the, the Catholics and the Protestants had sort of were at war with one another. It was a time at the start of the Reformation. And there was, you know, sort of all craziness kind of broke loose when people started reading the Bible in their own language and had a whole bunch of different ideas because it used to be read in Latin. So we are part of the tradition of tolerance and we are part of the tradition that uh, kind of ended people getting burned at the stake. We are part of that tradition of accepting different ideas. So when you kids talk about the church you go to at school, you can say we are a church where broad ideas, open ideas are accepted and people are allowed to think what they want, even though we try to encourage people to love in the same way. How's that? What do you think, Ian? Not bad, right? Yeah, there you go. Thumbs up. Okay, so we would normally sing out our kids. We're not going to do that. Um, I'd like us all to join in the affirmation of faith, if you would. It's printed in the bulletin here. You ready? Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humanity and fellowship to the end that all souls shall grow in harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other and with God or with the God you don't believe in. We're open to that too. Our centering hymn, which is designed to sort of, we remain seated for that. It's kind of a stilling setting us up for candles of joys and concerns. It's setting us up for the kind of peaceful part of this service. Is a beautiful hymn called Voice Still and Small. We're gonna listen through it once and then we're gonna sing it through twice. 391, Voice Still and Small. A Life Dedicated to Justice, Equality, and Peace by Paul S. Sawyer. We call to our minds today the life of a man of peace, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. We pray that like Dr. King, we may have the courage to live our convictions, even in the face of overwhelming opposition, that we may live a life dedicated to justice, equality, and peace. We pray today for all those suffering the terror and desolation of war, in Iraq and Sudan, women in Afghanistan, the, the women in Iraq, <laughs> in thousands of places we don't hear about in our news. We pray that all people may know peace and security, free from fear of bombs, free from the horror of tyranny, free to live and free to love. In particular, we pray for children, that they may know healing that solves the wounds of war, both physical and spiritual. We pray that they may live to know a life without fear. And we pray for ourselves, 
and for those in our community and in our own families who suffer, who mourn, and who face the extraordinarily and everyday difficulties and fears of this life. At times we are overwhelmed. At times we despair that in the face of the forces of oppression and sickness, of violence and destruction, our actions, our work, our faith amounts to nothing. Dr. King reminds us that with love and faith, one person really can change the world. Oh God, grant us ears to hear the prophets of our own time. May we have the wisdom to discern their message through the noise and discord of our lives. May we have the strength to do what we must be done in this world. We may find, wait, may we find the courage to live our lives as lives of conviction, of spirit of faith, May we know justice and peace in our time. Blessed be. Amen. And now just a moment of silence. Reflect on that. We continue that piece with a brief musical interlude. First, thanks for being here. You could have been chilling at home on a Sunday morning, but you came to church, and I'm grateful for that. And I think uh, we hold that standard that it makes you a better person. And we hope that, that we can live up to that. I want the kids to listen to this first part. I'm going to tell Martin Luther King's story. Before he was a postage stamp and had boulevards named after him, before he was awarded more than 50 honorary degrees and became accepted perhaps as the most important African-American in US history. Before in 1964, he became the youngest person to ever receive a Nobel Peace Prize. We got a statue before he was hoisted up in England, no less, up into Westminster Abbey. Martin Luther King was an almond-eyed kid named Michael. Yep, Michael. He'd only be renamed Martin Luther after his dad took a trip to Germany and changed both their names in honor of the German reformer. His being renamed at the ripe age of five was designed to instill a sense of responsibility in him, a sense of destiny. No spoiler alert needed, it worked. However, before anyone could predict the impressive, courageous, courageous and tragic life this kid named Mike would grow up to live, he was really the oldest kid um, of a talented church organist and a fiery preacher. He was a chubby middle child born in a privileged African-American neighborhood of Atlanta. His mom frequently brought her, brought her son around to various local churches to sing. He was a pretty good singer and even sang at the city's Atlanta's premiere of uh, the classic film, Gone with the Wind, interestingly enough. However, little much generally is said about the mom's influence on him. When Martin Luther King's story gets told, it's mostly his dad who steals the sort of parental influence up front. The King biographer, Michael Frady, described his dad as a commandingly chesty man. Martin Luther King's dad was bolder and he was a physically bigger person than Martin would ever be. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Martin Luther King Sr. literally threatened to hit one of his own parishioners with a chair at a challenging church meeting. 
My notes read me to look longingly off with pleasure <laughs> before I comically startle myself back to the present. King Sr. was demanding and angry enough to frequently beat his famous son. A neighbor of the king's overhearing one of the beatings that took place next door overheard Martin say to him that he was gonna make something of his son if it killed him. We don't encourage that kind of behavior in the church, kids. In hindsight, we can see that in a couple of ways it worked. The MLK we know reportedly took these beatings with a stoic resignation. When being hit, our young hero would tear up some, but always silently and always sternly never let himself audibly cry. Let's feel that little boy for a second, Martin Luther King as a kid. It would be a sternness and self-control in the face of a challenge that never left him. The message that Martin learned early on was that he should never, particularly around white people, ever give them any fodder to dismiss him to not take them absolutely seriously. His dad saw themselves as carrying on a noble standard that was set by Washington Carver, if you know history, that was something, and that was carried on kind of famously by Jackie Robinson, who when he was integrating baseball, took a lot of suffering with you know dignity and stoicism. Both saw their job as to live as a living contradiction to the stereotypes placed upon black people by white people um, and the caricatures that we had of them. And King spent a life publicly breaking, never really breaking that stern character. The MLK we celebrate this weekend grew up with the mind bending anger cultivating contrast of a home that instructed him that he was important. And then the minute he stepped out into the broader wild world beyond his immediate neighborhood was shown that he was just another, you can fill in the words. He was not only taught discipline and to be deeply firm in his lessons, but within the African American or community, he was a kid of privilege. He was the son of a well known pastor and they had, you know, a decent amount of money and stature. Being the son of a dad who went from sharecropper's kid to successful preacher meant that he had a special feeling and obligation and home in his neighborhood. Sociologically, people think that the recipe for creating dissent in a person and more collectively in a group of people is to first fill them with pride, give them dignity and inherent worth as we call it, and then show them they're worthless. That breeds activists. If you want to build an activist with strat, from scratch, give them dignity and then give them indignity. And King lived with that contrast. Our hero, my hero, was born with that cultural and psychological borderline that I think made him who he was. When he was a teenager, Martin worked at a local mattress store and at a local railway station, both. And in those roles, he witnessed some firsthand mistreatment of African-Americans in the South, indignities, that he faced and he committed at his heart when he was a teenager to hate every white person. All those experiences seem to form the stern statuesque professional demeanor we see in MLK. You can see that on the cover of the bulletin if you look at him, kid and then statue. We like to peak, create people who are a little bit softer than that, but he needed that. Those experiences led him to transcend what it was. He's relatively short and he was a little bit stout maybe average looks to have that kind of regal quality that we see in King. To fully understand the man we now and will honor on tomorrow, on Monday in particular, he was behind the scenes moody and impulsive. The balance of that public facade, which would create with the sort of depressingly brooding, selfish, indulgent stuff, everybody has a shadow side. Every one of us adults have we have our present self and we have our real self and they're always, they're never perfect. From his, uh, when we were waiting to an answer, he would, he was in childhood, he actually tried to jump out of his window and attempts to kill himself a couple times. So Martin Luther King struggled in many ways. From his teenage years on, he was, he would drink and smoke. And I think indulge is a fair word in the company of women. It was behavior of although hardly odd for his time or counter to the characters he was raised with, 
it, uh, he had sort of a binging, purging, anxiety quality to those behaviors. I don't know if his actions ever crossed the line into sort of me too worthy sins, but I, I don't know that they didn't either. By the time he was a teen, he'd cultivated enough polish that he was had the nickname of Natty. King was the kind of guy who drove a simple car, but he wore silk pajamas. Interestingly, he always requested those pajamas when he was arrested and spent the night in jail when he was, as we know, part of the strategy, something that happened to him a lot. He was always smaller and less aggressive than his dad. Like his teens coming up into his own, he chided against some of his upbringing. And you guys will find you want to be different than your parents at times. And in his mid-teens, he remembered denying the bodily resurrection of Christ, which was part of his tradition, and calling the style of his father's teaching kind of bombastic. He called it an embarrassment. Martin was always smart. And when he was a kid, he was listening to a preacher and whispered to his mother in the pew that day. He said, I want to have fancy words like that, too, when I grow up. It didn't take long. He would uh, have those fancy words, and he was always a bit of a wordsmith. He was accomplished and smart enough to skip the ninth grade. And then a few years later, when a unique opportunity presented itself because of World War uh, II, he was off to skip his senior year of high school and went off to uh, college when he was 15 years old. He went to Morehouse. And he went to Morehouse because there were so many African Americans who would have naturally been in that class at the time that went off to war that they needed, they vacated, there was enough spots that they offered an opportunity. So he was in college by the time he was 15. He passed the entrance exam, and it had to be an ego boost for him at that time. He was smart, he was cavalier, he was a romantic you know, sort of undergrad, and he was a good but not great student. He always sat in the back of the class. King was always smart, he had a great vocabulary, but he never was that detail oriented. He and I share a commitment to justice and a love of writing, and, and we share also a carelessness around grammar and accurate spelling, which led me to believe that maybe someday I'll get a holiday. So the next time you read a newsletter and you wonder why there's not a comma there, or there is a comma there, or Teresa's editing when I write, you can think, I'm just trying to be more like Martin Luther King. He liberally borrowed from the ideas of others, which I don't do. He simply plagiarized through much of his academic career. His real intellectual gift, though, was not as an academic that has detailed work and sort of has per perfect footnotes. He was what you might call a practical theologian. He was a thinker. He was a student. He was certainly an intellectual. But he was never as diligent as in the academic side of it as he was in what he would do with those ideas. Thank God for that. Those who studied his work and patterns most discerned that he synthesized information into his own framework really well. And he became a hybrid of a preacher with a little bit of that emotional black style that's famous in the African American community. And he also was a guy with a sophisticated education. And you can hear that in the way his speech, his cadence and his words are sort of contrasting but beautiful. He was flowery, really, without being too pretentious. And he was emotional without being overly sentimental, I think. He's my favorite person to listen to. I, I, he, he mesmerizes me. I almost can't hear him without kind of tearing up. So King, Jesus, my grandfather, Brad Pitt, and my dad are my heroes, all for different reasons. And for me, his great gift was that he walked his talk, and he did that all throughout a struggle. Truth is, King walked his talk so much that it's hard for me to even listen sometimes. King always does that job of making me feel like I don't do enough. He's like, he's in my head like a Jewish mother. He was at Morehouse, he got the idea of to, to big theological ideas, and he, um, he was exposed to Thoreau's discourse on civil disobedience, Thoreau being one of ours, of course. And the idea of using civilian tactics to, uh, to refuse a and cooperate with an evil system. And he got that also from Gandhi. So he began to sort of put the pieces together. He took his anger and indignancy of the way blacks were treated with some techniques that he became kind of famous for. 
But he was also still kind of a womanizer. He ran with a group of male friends who called themselves the Wreckers for their proclivity to win and dispense the hearts of women, less admirable use of his intellect and his gifts. But style aside, romantic and or ego driven lustful interests, Martin was always determined to make a difference. He was after all renamed in the, in the name of a famous reformer, Martin Luther, to do so. He never forgot that. He never didn't think that was his mission. While as an undergrad, he was teasing with visions of how he might do or make a difference. He considered laws and uh, careers in science and even law, but he made the practical decision to go into the ministry as a place he could be the most impactful. At 18, while finishing his up his undergrad degree, at 18, he went home to enter the ministry. And he was called that decision a heartless, a, a, a heatless decision, driven by it was a strong desire to give over to the practicalities of life, his life. It sounds like King, doesn't it? How very cool and rational of him to decide to do something so emotional because it would make the greater difference. King described his choice to leave school and, re and return to church as a most reasonable way to serve that inner urge to serve humanity. Although following in his father's footsteps, obviously, he made a very intentional personal choice to walk that path in a more rational and intellectual way than his dad ever could. His first step was to literally take over the church that he was um, in, his dad's church, and he stood in the pulpit for the first time, still a teen, and he reported, as a one biographer describes it, as a dwindling version of his dad in the pulpit until he started speaking. And then he was brilliant. At the end of his first sermon, he would ever preach in his home church, the congregation he grew up in, they rose to their feet and they cheered. They didn't know, they could never know, they wouldn't have recognized that he largely ripped off that sermon from a famous preacher, Harry Emerson Fosdick. Nonetheless, he was good. Confident that he had style, but maybe not the full intellectual gravitas of commitment that, it, that he would want, he went off to Crozier Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania at 19. He was home for just a brief period of time. King entered this small Northern seminary with a disciplined desire to get his polish up. And he always was concerned to represent Negroes as he called them and people were called. Um, so he scolded some of his classmates for having beer in his room. And he became a more conscientious student at that time in his life as he had ever, than he had ever been. And he read Marx and he tried his own personal experiences against the liberal theologians of his age. He continued to be captivated with Thoreau throughout all his life, most specifically the idea that one noble person could transform society. While at Crozier, he first encountered Gandhi, like I said before, and his nonviolent resistance in India, which had not that much earlier taken place. Reflecting in, on that time as he thought, he said that he had been pushed he changed his belief that armed revolt was the only likely way to change segregation in the South. Nevertheless, what he learned from Gandhi was that he could paint with broad brushes, good and evil, and he learned well. Eventually he grew more comfortable with the small seminary that he was in at Crozier and began to reach out socially. He started drinking a little bit, started playing pool. He always had that CAD side to him. At Crozier, he fell in love with this German girl. It was a girl who worked in the kitchen hard enough that he was aiming to marry her. She was a white girl. And then he obviously was talked out of it, but heartbroken that a biracial relationship would have held him back too much. And he was heartbroken. He went through a period of depression after that. And amidst this romance and depression at Crozier, he also became the student he had never been. And he became the valedictorian of Crozier and he received uh, an award, a scholarship to pursue a doctorate at Boston University. At the time of his graduation from Crozier, his proud dad bought him a fancy new green car and they sent them off to Boston. It was a big uh, draw for me to sit in some of the same seats that he sat in. In fact, when I was first there, I shared a teacher who taught him in his last two years, who taught me in my first two years, a man named Walter Mulder. I thought that was just super cool. 
in Boston, beginning to pursue his PhD, met Coretta Scott King, who was studying at the, as a soloist at the New England Conservatory of Music. They formally courted and they took in Boston's classical music scene. And, uh, and on the summer breaks down, in, uh, he went and got married. He was 24 years old. His dad was none too pleased that he didn't get his uh, son married off to one of the upper crust uh, girls in Atlanta, reassuring, reassuring that he would return home. And he never did take over his father's pulpit permanently as his dad had wished him to do. He did eventually co-minister together briefly, um, but I'm getting ahead of myself. At, in Boston, he mingled with Unitarians a lot and somewhere occasionally attended Arlington Street Church. Although King's encounters with Unitarianism were, were hardly worth much mention in a real biography, they're of us, for us of interest. In fact, after his death, Coretta said that her husband, she thought that her husband, if he had, could have had the same impact as a Unitarian pastor and activist that as he would have had as a Baptist, he would have become a Unitarian. Thank God he didn't. Not that it wouldn't have been great to have Martin Luther King, but affiliation to our movement aside, who would ever risk the impact he did have? King in that same, in his speech uh, about the bus boycott, he took counsel from UU ministers down south, and he spoke at the, at the memorial service of UU minister James Reeb, who went down south and got killed. A year later, he was invited in 1966 to speak as the Ware Lecturer at the General Assembly, and his title of his sermon was Don't Sleep Through the Revolution. We at Beacon Press, the UU Press owned by UUs, uh, have sole publishing rights to all his works. At BU, Martin continued to digest the theology movements of the day. He got connected to Howard Thurman, who was famous, and all of those things that took place. And he got a gig back in Dexter, at the Dexter Church in Montgomery, Alabama, 26 years old. He had finished his dissertation and had his first kid. There was no moss on this Rolling Stone at all. We're, of course, beginning to reach the phase in his life where he starts to become famous. And he got a phone call and he was asked to lead the local citywide bus boycott, famously set off by Rosa Parks. On December 5th, on Monday morning following Rosa Parks now uh, refusal to get up from her seat when she was arrested, he, he was the leader appointed leader of the bus boycott and watched empty buses roll by. He was shocked that the cry for a bus boycott basically worked. He would never be the same. We would never be the same. I'm not going to document his entire battle of civil rights. I barely need to set the scene. The fights in the 50s and the 60s are perhaps the best and worst moments in American history. You have some of those images seared into your head. Many of you lived through them. Churches overflowing with hopeful, scared people singing hymns that led them out the doors to perform the courageous yet simple acts of walking and sitting and gathering where they were not allowed. Very frequently inspired by King's own words of courage, African Americans walked out of those churches, crossed bridges, entered town centers where the troops angry, entitled, hooded people sometimes awaited. There was a violence that we hadn't seen in, for a long time in that period until maybe the last couple of years. As sad and ironic as it is, whenever there was no dramatic violence that spilled into the newspapers or the television, to early televisions of people, there really was no successes. King and his friends, his leaders, needed to perform the difficult job of getting people into harm's way, getting people hurt and subsequently into the public eye for the morality of the cause to be fully felt by the white community that they needed to change laws and change the hearts of Americans. Tragically, kids blown away with fire hoses and women beaten with sticks and had dogs turned on them were the only times those campaigns were really successful. Had it not been for his steady nonviolent call, that era likely would have been even bloodier than it was. It was all hard, hard, and their efforts succeeded less than half the time. In private, as strong as he was in public, 
He was terrified of dying for good reason. During the 13 years from the bus boycott to the time he was killed, basically 55 to 68, he was talking to mayors and presidents. His house was bombed. He was life lived constantly under threat. He was at times offered honorary degrees and then he was attacked. He was beaten up. He was hit flat by a flying brick in Chicago. He was stabbed nearly to death. He was praised and mocked and threatened by his government in the very same day. He was arrested, had his hotel rooms bugged and was essentially treated like royalty at banquets. Just before he would receive the Nobel Peace Prize, he and Coretta were sent a suicide note as an encouragement for him to kill himself and blackmail tapes of um, Martin with other women when they had bugged the rooms. King wanted political reform to what really was kind of an apartheid system down south, but he also wanted to flip the script. He had a brilliant idea of placing the epic wrong of segregation in biblical terms kind of Cain and Abel wrong, and a, and a wrong where both brothers were crippled by that dynamic, that broken relationship is the way he spoke about it. And as much as anyone can change a culture, he of course and thousands with him in mostly small cities, Selma, Birmingham, Montgomery, reminded us of the moral sagas of the Bible are still alive and well. Racism was of course for King systematic acts that denied access to black people to opportunities, but it was also a vision of what the United States really could be that he planted in people's heads. It was that high minded view that kept King unable to see a victory that did not tr transform the hearts of white America. His understanding was that whites were victims of this too. And whatever change might happen, it was love that needed to be at the core of it. When faced with the brutality he saw in St. Augustine, Florida, which was about some of the worst of it, he came to doubt that nonviolent resistance would be enough. He was on the edge. However, publicly, he never wavered that it could be done any other way. In practical terms, he saw that violence between blacks and whites would be a loss for both, and at the end, they were gonna need to live together. He stood in pulpits and said things like this. We will meet forces of hate with powers of love. We must say to our white brothers all over the South, we will march your capacity to inflict suffering with our capacity to endure it. Bomb our homes and we will still love you. We will appeal to your heart and conscience and we will win you in the process. Whew. Sorry. King was poetically said to be a moral set designer for America, who turned an important idea like voting rights into the battle for the soul of our nation. To me, you can't really, if you don't feel deep down in your bones, how powerful and good it feels to be part of something epic like that, you don't really get him. And because he saw things that way is why it pulled him to be opposed to the Vietnam, Vietnam War and eventually poor people's issues around the globe and here. In his last few years, he really did extend that vision beyond race into economic issues and war issues, as most of us know. And he began to say that the US was on the wrong side of a world revolution. And in that spirit in 1968, he chose to step in and provide support for the sanitation workers in Memphis. And on that morning, on that journey to campaign and support them. On April 4th, he stepped out on a balcony of the Lorraine Motel and he was shot and killed. Shot by James Earl Jones, who a lot of ink suggests did not act alone. His first responders came from the police at the fire station, which were across the street providing, connected to FBI agents who were providing surveillance monitoring the actions of King and his crew at the hotel. He was rushed to the hospital and died after surgery failed. The antagonism between King and the FBI led to a lack of an all points bulletin to find the killer and the police presence nearby led to the speculation that the FBI might have been involved in his assassination. 
in an act that harkens back to the saving of a martyr in like old Christian terms, Walter Abernathy was his best friend and he having returned from the hospital, took a stiff bit of paper use, we used to have in the collars of, the, of uh, ironed coats and he dipped into the blood on the ground or the jar and he saved King's blood in a jar like you would a martyr. Jesse Jackson was always nearly by his side, dipped his hands into the blood itself and spread it all over the sh his own white shirt at that time. When the doctor performed King's autopsy, they said that it was 39 year old King, he died at 39, that he had a 60 year old heart. King's main legacy is not only sealed almost in tribute in an act of appeasement to the violence that ensued the minute he got shot, in the Civil, Acts, Civil Rights Act of 1968. And if that's not enough in 1982, a national holiday we celebrate tomorrow was established in his honor. To those who wish to remain in control of others' lives, he was a subversive. King was an imperfect man with a perfect vision. But to me, he was a, he was a hero I feel honored to have shared the earth with for a year. He took an ugly part of our country and made it believe in a great idea. King gave us hope and much of the blueprint for how America could, could be whole. King reminds us just how powerful the idea of love can be. So what does he mean to us today? Probably none of us are gonna be King. But the question asks of him, I think to all of us is what imprudent, selfless, ego-driven, even high-minded thing are you going to do with your precious time here? What? What are you going to do with your one wild and precious life here? Amen. Thanks. And now time for our offertory which is a much lighter tone, <laughs> I promise you. Join me in our extinguishing the chalice words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Amen. I invite you to stand in spirit or in body and with your masks on, sadly, we're going to sing this little light of mine, 118. We usually face the back as a call to our mission to the world and our call to step out into it and be all that we want to be. 118, this little light of mine. Oh, source of peace, lead us to peace a peace profound and true. Lead us to a healing to mastery of all that drives us to war within ourselves and others. May our deeds inscribe us in the book of life and blessing with righteousness and peace. O oh, source of peace, bless us with the same. Amen. Amen.